Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burak of Wall Street for Mean Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Mean Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. I like to have him on every three or four months. He has his finger right on the pulse of the primary gold and silver miners because they are always bringing him potential deals along with the base metal miners. He, ha- he is a gold medal accounting award winner, and he also was the first employee and the youngest chief financial officer of a publicly traded company with a billion dollar market cap at the time at Silver Wheaton, now Wheaton Precious Metals. Now he is the president, CEO, and director of Sandstorm Gold, which is an American co- uh, Canadian company on an American exchange symbol SAND, S-A-N-D, that has almost a billion dollar market cap. So Nolan Watson, thank you for joining me again. Well, thanks for having me. Now, Nolan, before we talk about anything specific about your company, and congratulations on another solid quarter, which you guys announced this week, Q1 2019, let me get your opinion on the state of the primary gold and silver miners. So how would you grade how the miners have dealt with the ability to cut costs? Because when we're recording this podcast now on Thursday, May 9th, the oil prices have had a big rally the last couple of months. Brent crude is back to a little over $70 a barrel. WTI is back to almost $62 a barrel, at $61.70. And metals prices in dollars are at $12.83 for gold. And silver is under 15 again at $14.72. So what do you think is going on with the balance sheet of the primary gold and silver miners and then maybe the production costs? Yeah, I think the the balance sheets are differing between gold companies and silver companies right now. So if you look at gold companies, for example, the the situation that they're facing is the gold price has been flat for an extended period of time. It's not really a high gold price. It's not really a low gold price. It's kind of a lukewarm gold price, just shy of $1,300 an ounce. But we're seeing for the first time in a while a bit of cost creep. So as you pointed out, oil prices are going up, labor prices are going up, some power prices are going up. And a lot of these guys have been trying to save money for quite a period of time and not investing in a lot of sustaining capital. So trucking fleets are getting older than they were before and therefore they're more expensive to maintain, so on and so forth. And so you're starting to see the cost go up of producing gold around the world. Not materially, but it's going up uh, much faster than normal inflation is. And so some of that sustaining capex that wasn't paid over the last few years when prices were even lower is starting to catch up with companies. And so their their margins are getting squeezed right now. But, but the balance sheets are still generally fairly healthy. And the companies are doing what I would describe as okay. Not fantastic, but uh, but just okay. But if you look at silver companies, it's a completely different story. So the the traditional historical ratio of silver prices to gold prices is uh, is not at all happening right now. Silver prices are much more depressed than gold prices relative to the cost of producing silver. And so you're seeing silver companies just bleeding cash. Almost all of them are losing money. Almost all of them have negative operating cash flow. And the ones that have really low cost operations and have positive operating cash flow, that positive operating cash flow is generally speaking not enough for them to pay back their debt. And so balance sheets are getting tighter and tighter and tighter and the CEOs are getting more and more worried. And so even companies like I was just reading Hecla put out their earnings yesterday and noticed that they've had to get covenant amendments from the banks because uh, if they didn't, they would have been offside their debt covenants because they're not making enough money. And you're seeing that throughout the, they're not alone. You're seeing that throughout the uh, the entire silver industry. So if you believe in silver, which I do, I think silver is actually going to perform very well over the next five years. It is a very challenging situation to try to figure out which companies to invest in because they do have such poor balance sheets on average that it's a bit of playing chicken with the train because you don't know if that company is going to survive <laughs> till the point where where the prices actually come back and, and you're going to make money, your investment could go to zero before before your thesis plays out. So it's a bit of an interesting time right now. Yeah, I've been noticing that as well. Um, and you mentioned Hecla. I've been following Hecla for years now. And over the last about four or five years, Hecla, I noticed, has been putting less of their investment dollars into silver. They've been buying gold mines. They've been share, uh, diluting shareholders and trying to buy producing gold mines and moving more of their production away from silver and base metal and moving more of their revenues to gold. So you would say then that's been common industry-wide for years now. 
Yeah, you're certainly seeing a lot of the big silver guys slowly move over to gold. Um, silver Wheaton, where I used to work, they became Wheaton Precious Metals, changed their name last year because, uh, lo and behold, they're 50% gold now, and you're seeing that throughout the industry. The guys that have stayed uh, as tied to silver as much as they can, they're really hurting because the silver price has been so depressed they just can't make money. Yeah, and if the oil prices stay at these levels or, God forbid, go higher and the metals prices don't go higher to offset this, the margins for Q2, Q3 are going to be very, very bad compared to what they were in Q1. So if investors think that the earnings announcements and things were bad in Q1, they can get a lot worse. Absolutely. So let me get your opinion then on these mergers and acquisitions. You know, Rick Rule has been saying for years that these, uh, these uh, big acquisitions like Bear Gold buy, uh, merging with Anglo Gold Ashanti and Newmont Mine buy, buying, uh, excuse me, buying Gold Corp should have occurred years ago. So why do you think that these were delayed so long? Is it because that these executives didn't want to take pay cuts, they didn't want to fire um, executive vice presidents? Why do you think these mergers and ac acquisitions in the gold mining space were delayed so long? That's funny. In the last uh, seven business days, I've met with four out of the five managing directors of uh, investment banking for the mining industry for the Canada's major banks, who they're the ones that are working on this on a daily basis. So I'd say I've got a pretty good sense of, of what's going on behind the scenes right now in M&A, as well as sort of the backstories of how all of these deals uh, came about, the Barrick mergers, etc. And it's a particularly interesting time. If you go back even two years ago, People were talking about M&A, but it was never happening. And the reason it was never happening was almost all personnel-related issues. It wasn't necessarily that Company A wanted to buy Company B and they couldn't agree on price. That company A wanted to buy Company B and they could agree on price, but they couldn't agree who was going to be the CEO of the new Company A <clears throat> and who, how many board directors were going to come over and, and basically who was going to control it. And, and all the CEOs were fighting for their jobs. So you had all these mergers that made sense, that were obvious no-brainers to the investment bankers, to a lot of the investors, even to the management teams themselves, but nobody wanted to lose their job. So the mergers weren't happening. And I think what you're actually starting to see happen is that the, the industry has gotten tougher and tougher and tougher year after year after year for six years running. A lot of the CEOs at the larger companies are getting long in the tooth. They're getting older and older and older. They kind of plan to be retiring around now and uh, it's just kind of depressing running a company where the product that you're selling which you don't control the price of goes down every year and you're making less and less money and so uh, those soft issues are are going away because a lot of the CEOs are just going actually I don't I don't even want my job anymore so so you're you're we're now in a state of the industry where CEOs are going around looking for mergers sales acquisitions and going no you run the company and the other CEO is going no I want you to run the company and uh, and so mergers are actually happening because people aren't trying to hold on to their jobs as much as they were, say, two to five yeah. years ago. And, and, and the dam is broken, if you will. Now, if I was a contrarian, I would say that the sign that the CEOs don't want to be there and the metals prices are going sideways for so long, the sentiment is so negative, that sounds like it's going to start to be bullish when we least expect it in the near future. Oh, absolutely. I mean, people... When people are just sick and tired and down and out and they've felt that way for a long period of time, that's when you got to be deploying capital and buying things because that's when it's going to turn around. It's yes. So would you say then, before we move on to your company, a couple more questions then on the uh, industry in general. So would you say then that pretty much all the production costs at the mine site, though that fat has already been trimmed for years now and the only remaining cost that can be cut then is like in selling general administrative expenses through mergers and acquisitions, and that's about all the remaining costs that, that can be cut? Yeah, there are still the ability on a mine by mine basis to start truly high grading, and when I say high grading, I don't mean marginally focusing on slightly higher graded material. I mean taking a 15-year mine plan and turning it into a five-year mine plan and literally just cutting out the high grade, that would drop your operating cost for five years, but then it kills your mine. Those opportunities are still out there. The odd company is taking advantage of it, but by and large, most companies aren't, which I think is a good thing because I do think it is going to turn around. And, and when you start high grading it, you kill your mine because you end up making uh, sustaining capital decisions that now make the other 10 years that you would have mined uneconomic, even if commodity prices do turn around. And so 
so outside of that, I would agree with you that basically just cutting GNA and cutting fat at the top and excess management is basically the the only cost cutting that's left. All the all of the fat is out at the mining level. Yeah, and what you talked about with high grading that would destroy the long term project economics at the mine. But I guess if the CEO wants to keep his job and wants to keep the company from going bankrupt, I guess that would be like an emergency type of measure. But I was talking with my podcast listeners for the last few months now that, you know, these mergers and acquisitions and the things that the mining company executives are doing are like truly desperate measures now at this point. And you talked about this on the conference call yesterday for your company about how like a lot of the mid-tier producing miners cannot raise capital, the equity they need. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, there's no equity out there right now unless you have uh, one large lead order from some unique sovereign wealth fund or, or billionaire who particularly likes your project. Outside of that, nobody can raise money, and so it's, it's causing a lot of challenges out there. Yeah, I, I've heard the same things. And so one of Sandstorm Gold's uh, streaming partners, your copper stream on Chapada, I think this is a good case study of the industry because – Yamana Gold was telling people publicly in all their shareholder documents on their conference calls how Chapa, which is a producing copper, gold, and silver mine in Brazil, is their lowest cost, best margin mine. But they needed to invest, what, a couple hundred, over $200 million in CapEx in upgrades over the next couple years. And it looks like they didn't have the capital. And so they sold the asset, even though they probably didn't want to sell the asset. They were doing cost-benefit analysis. And it looks like that that's going to end up benefiting Sandstorm Gold because they ride along for free as part of the business model, right? Yeah, I think their their situation is is not unique to them, and it's it, as you said partially related to capex. But I think the even bigger story there was they had a tremendous amount of debt and did not have a reasonable time frame with which they were going to be able to repay that debt with cash flow from operations. And it was just I think they as a management team were decided it was too risky to be in that. Per- situation perpetually and it's mostly a copper mine not a gold mine and they're a gold company so take a bunch of money off the table pay down some debt get ready and try to go look for the next gold asset to buy i think that was a lot of the logic behind it which which to a certain extent made sense um but we definitely get the benefit of it because it's going from a company that had lots of debt and did not have a lot of free cash flow to spare to invest in the expiration of the asset, even though it was a good asset and they were spending some money on expiration. But it's going to Lundin, which is a much more well-capitalized company that has better resources, it has better cash flow, and they, I think they're going to invest more heavily into the asset going forward and will benefit from that, obviously, as a stream holder on Chapata. So do you think then that some of that capital is going to be invested into Agua, Agua Rica? So I know that Agua Rica is kind of a little bit longer term, but I wrote an article a couple months ago, a blog article on Seeking Alpha about Agua Rica, and it looks like Sandstorm Gold for their $12 million bet that you put down for a right of first refusal gold stream option on Agua Rica for $12 million at the end of 2015, that now that bet has really paid off and that mine is going to be fast-tracked over the next couple of years. And potentially there's three ways I outlined in the article that Sandstorm Gold shareholders could profit from that asset now. Yeah, it's, it's something that we took a bet that we thought eventually gold prices were going to go higher. We thought that it was going to take a while to develop, and the idea was that we would get an option to... Uh, do a gold stream for predetermined price metrics and and we would sort of wait it out and watch that option go into the money. The project's actually going forward a lot faster than I had anticipated when we originally did that deal, which which is good and, and also has bad sides. Uh, I think the good side is that one of the options that we have is we can just hold the royalty. So it's not a normal early gold deposit option. What it is is we bought a royalty, we own a royalty, we we have that royalty and we can keep it for no additional payment and we'll start getting checks when they build the mine in and go forward with it. Or we can hand back the royalty and make additional payments and turn it into a much larger gold stream. And so we don't know yet what the the new version of the mine is going to be. They're basically trying to figure out how to integrate it with the Alambrera mine and we don't know what the sequencing is going to be or the gold production is going to be. And so we're sitting here with this nice option that if after they planned out the mine, if it looks incredibly profitable for us to make those extra payments, we will do so. 
And if it doesn't look like it makes sense for us to make those extra payments, we'll just continue to hold the royalty and we'll be happy to start collecting checks. There's obviously the, the other path that we can take, which is we can sell that option to one of the bigger companies and or we can syndicate it with them so we can take a piece of that option and we can give one of the bigger streaming royalty companies another piece of that option and have them pay us for that right. So there's lots of different ways it can play out. It's still going to be several years before I think we have to make that decision, but it is, as you said, it's a good example of how if we, we think long-term enough and, and are willing to take some bets out into the future, it can potentially really pay off for us. And Nolan, I think this is something that a lot of people are missing with Samsung Gold with the stock right now. And yes, you guys have almost a billion dollar market cap in the U.S. And you have a good amount of assets generating cash flow. But I don't think the market is properly valuing a lot of the growth assets in the pipeline. For example, that bet you made there on Agua Rica for only $12 million, a Canadian investment bank analyst at a 5% discount rate has that option worth over $50 million. I've seen estimates between $50 million and $75 million. And yet there's a number of other growth assets that were made years ago when you guys were thinking more long-term and being more contrarian, and you didn't put that much money down on these bets. And I think the market is, there's, in my opinion, there's hundreds of millions of dollars of value in the growth pipeline that is not in your cash flow projections that right now the market is valuing at zero. Yeah, so right now we've got, uh, call it 22 streams and royalties that are currently producing, and over the next few years we know that that number is going to go up to probably closer to 27 to 30, depending on what happens. But we actually own own about 190 royalties, and a whole bunch of them are at the development stage. And we have a policy of never putting any of those development stage royalties into our publicly stated cash flow guidance number. So if someone went on to Sandstorm's website and downloaded our presentation and showed what our saw what our cash flow projections were over the next five years, you're literally only looking at those 25 to 30 royalties that we know are going into production right now. And all of the other 160, if you will, are not included in there at all. Uh, I agree with you. I think there are are hundreds of millions of dollars of valuation in that other 160. And I think currently it gets valued at approximately zero inside of our market cap. I'm okay with that because I do believe, given a long enough time horizon, and I do plan on being here for that time horizon, that when those assets get built, they'll get put into our cash flow and we'll get, get the value for them. And what most people don't understand is replacement value. So right now, and you've talked about this a lot on conference calls and in past interviews with me, there's a lot of new players coming into the royalty and streaming space. I've noticed how the cost of deals over the last four to six years has gone up a lot. What you used to be able to buy for $40 million, $60 million, even $70 or $80 million when you were first getting started over those first couple of years is very, very different than compared to now. So maybe I think a lot of people don't understand that there's a lot of new players, whether it's private equity money or these smaller royalty and streaming companies than Sandstorm Gold. I'm seeing some of these deals, and I'm not going to name names, Nolan, but some people are paying like $40 million for a royalty package or they're, um, with no cash flow, no chance of any immediate cash flow, or they're paying $20 million for $1 million per year on a royalty. So it seems like the valuations on these deals are up maybe two to three-fold since when you started. Maybe you can comment on that with the low returns of, of uh, IRR. Yeah, although I don't want to give away too much of the – secret sauce of how we run our business, uh, just because there, there is competition out there. What I would say is that it's very tempting for CEOs in our industry to be lazy and have small corporate development teams and sit there and wait for investment bankers to phone them and say, there's a royalty for sale. We're running a process. We're phoning all the other royalty companies. We're going to let you bid on it, and it's going to be a blind bid and highest price wins. And so there are a bunch of CEOs sitting around just waiting for those phone calls, waiting for someone to tell them there's an opportunity to bid. And it's sort of the winner's curse. Every time you win one of those bids, it's because you were the, the guy who paid too much. <laughs> and so we actually have a state of policy that if we get a phone call from an investment banker saying there's an opportunity to bid, we don't. We 
know that that's not a good way to run a business. And if all we're doing is, around, is sitting around and waiting for the opportunity to pay the highest price in something, that we should fold up the company and go home. And like, why is the company paying us to be a management team if that's all we're doing? I mean, a five-year-old kid could do that. And so <clears throat> our, we believe the best way to run a company is to outwork people and find opportunities long before the investment banker even knows they're an opportunity and work directly with the company to uh, buy a stream of royalty from them in a way that is more creative and more flexible to that company to allow them to grow themselves, but in a way that's also more creative to us and uh, and allows us to get a higher rate of return. And so we've been focusing on that. I think we've been pretty successful if people look at the last several years of deals that we've done, I think we've done a very good job of, of getting value and continuing to grow. I would agree with that. And the latest example of that is the Fruta del Norte royalty that you got from Keith Barron. And there was an article that came out in a mining journal not too long after that deal, and it sounded like no one else knew that Keith Barron had that royalty for sale. So you guys did your homework, you talked to Keith, and you were able to buy that royalty at a reasonable price without bidding on it because that royalty is going to what cash flow projected $3 million per year for the first few years and then ramp up to $5 million per year. And then there's a lot of exploration upside with the land package. Normally, if that, if that type of royalty, Nolan, would have hit the marketplace, I mean, you'd be looking at at least 50 maybe $60 million in a bid, perhaps even higher than that. And you guys bought it for, what, $32 million in cash? Yeah, I think it was one of those deals that was exactly what I was talking about where I do think it was a win-win and Keith had some, uh, without getting into details, some particular nuances that were important to him and we spent a lot of time working on that to make sure that he got those those nuances and we got what we wanted which was the precious metal royalty and I think he's happy and we're happy and, and that's kind of how we conduct business and exactly to your point, it's an asset with a huge amount of exploration upside and there's several hundred square kilometers of underexplored land that fall within that royalty. And uh, we're excited to see what the future holds for, for the exploration upside there. Yeah, and I think that's one of the best examples I've seen. And a lot of other analysts who cover mining stocks and cover your company are missing this and not giving you guys the credit you deserve for avoiding those bidding wars. Because, you know, when I look at some of these other deals that are going, it looks like Fruta del Norte, that NSR is better than a lot of the uh, some of these other deals that sell for seventy, eighty, ninety million dollars. Yep, no, it's definitely a good asset. So let me talk. Let me ask you then about the investment checklist and your due diligence process, your deal checklist, because over the last couple of years, there's been some write-offs and bad deals from other royalty and streaming companies larger than you. There's been a write down on the Orion Mining, Mine Finance. Royal Gold has had a few deals that go bad. So you've been doing this now for what, uh, 10 years just this hands from gold. You were at Silver Wheaton before that. So what have you learned? How has your investment checklist, deal checklist changed and evolved over the years then to avoid those bad deals where you have to write off uh, an enormous amount of money? <laughs> well, I could, I could talk about this for eight hours straight. I'll, I'll spare you. <laughs> the boring minutia, but at the end of the day, when you're in an industry long enough, you get to see a lot of things go wrong and, and you start learning and adapting. And, and one thing we've learned over the years is that there's no substitute for having a, an experienced technical team that has been there, done that, and seen basically everything that could ever go wrong with a mine. And, uh, and so we've continued to build out bench strength on the engineering side and the geology side and uh, the metallurgy side inside Sandstorm, and we have a truly world-class technical team. And you know, there's more than just technical things that can go wrong when you make an investment in the mining industry. I think as many investors who are probably listening to this uh, have experienced, sometimes it's not just that the mine didn't work out well. Sometimes it's that the management team made some really poor decisions. Sometimes it's that they over-levered themselves. Sometimes it's that they over hedge themselves. There's a whole bunch of things that the management team can do wrong and screw up. Sometimes it's political interference, et cetera, et cetera. There's an almost infinite number of things that could potentially go wrong. And so I think our, our business team as well has been doing this just about as long as anybody else in the entire industry in terms of providing capital to to mining companies and buying streams and royalties. And so between our technical team and our business team, uh, we do a, a very detailed, thorough due diligence job of all of the risks 
and uh, and we've got a very a very well developed complicated system that we go through that is uh, both qualitative as well as very quantitative and and takes quite a bit of time for us to go through but it helps us to to avoid those pitfalls and and I think it's been working and and we've got it we've got it dialed in now we're not no one's perfect we're not going to be perfect but I would say that that I think we're starting to demonstrate a track record that is uh, is better than most of our competitors if not all of them and and it continues to get better and I think we're we're pretty proud that we've developed what I believe to be um, a, a truly world-class due diligence process. Does understanding where you are in the cycle for gold prices, silver prices, base metal prices, is that important to avoiding bad deals then, say, of not in, for example, maybe not investing in a new mine if the metals prices are falling and the oil prices are rising, or looking at a balance sheet repair type of deal with a producing miner? It's funny that you ask that because <laughs> this is going back probably five years ago. Uh, our management team, we prepared a very, very detailed analysis for a board of directors of basically every every investment that we had ever made in the history of the company. And, and you got a, So around then we had, I don't know, 100 royalties or something like that. And we also analyzed some of the deals of our competitors and we analyzed deals that we had done in, in previous companies. And the the idea behind it was to try to figure out what commonalities, what are the things that are common amongst successful deals and what are the things that tend to be common amongst unsuccessful deals. So you're looking at everything from if you made or lose money, how correlated it, is it to resource error issues, how correlated is it to expiration upside by deposit type, how correlated is it to geographies or management teams or you know, one of the things that we correlated all of, all of these deals with was with commodity prices. So your question is, is is important to understand where where you are in the cycle. And so, the number one predictor by far about whether or not you're going to make money on a deal was actually simply did the commodity price go up in the five years after the deal or did it go down? And that was that was single handedly accounted for about seventy percent of the returns. And so every, I, I don't want to diminish all of the other things that we do and the importance of due diligence because that's hugely, hugely important. But knowing where you are in the commodity cycle is single-handedly the most important thing that you should do. You should be investing at the bottom and not at the top. Well, well, I think if, if, if other companies, and Sandstorm Gold has talked about this, you have talked about this for many years, that you're focused on the lowest cost project only, right? So if you focus on the bottom, the lowest cost quartile, what, 25% lowest cost project, and you avoid those marginal projects that only make money at higher commodities prices where there's less margin for error, then that you're already reducing a lot of your risk then, right? Yeah, it definitely does uh, reduce risk. But I guess even further than that, though, is even if you invest in a low cost producing asset, if you do it when gold's $2,000 an ounce and you're close to the top of the market, and you pay a very high multiple for that, and then gold, after you do the deal, drops back to $1,300 an ounce, you are still going to lose money, uh, and you're going to lose a lot of money. So uh, the types of mines matter, yes. The quality of the mines matter, yes. Expiration upside matters, yes. But not overpaying at the top of the cycle matters just as much, if not more, and making sure that you get good deals at the bottom of the cycle and not being afraid to pull the investment trigger at the bottom is just as important. And I, w I would say that's not just a thing about how to run a streaming royalty company. That's just a statement about how to make smart investments in the mining industry. If you're a retail investor and you're trying to figure out hey, how come I keep losing money, it's probably because you're getting that one thing wrong. <laughs> so let's talk about the newest deal you did. It's with a junior Sandstorm Gold that's focused on mid-tier and senior mining counterparties, but there's a lot of things to like about this junior. The, the project, the mine, first of all, is in Nevada. There's already infrastructure there. It's a mine that was already in production years ago. Pierre Lassonde is involved in the deal, so Pierre Lassonde's like a mining legend. And then on top of that, this management team is not people who are your or my age with limited experience. They're senior management teams who have come over from Barrick Gold. So maybe talk more about this America Silver deal and why you like the deal, even though it's a junior. 
Yeah, it's an asset that our technical team likes. Um, it's low capital intensity, which means if mistakes go wrong during the development process that they're very inexpensive to fix and they don't take very long to fix. Uh, it should be a quick build. It's permitted. Uh, it's in the United States, so we like all those things. The management team, as you said, came over from Barrick. Darren Blasuti, the CEO, used to be running corporate development for them for a number of years, a very uh, sophisticated mining guy. He's been around for a long time. And so there's a lot to like about the deal. I think that we were able to structure something that was very flexible for them that will allow them to grow their company. Uh, we were able to act faster than any of the other counterparties that they're dealing with, which is one of the reasons they wanted to go with us. And in return, we ended up getting a very high rate of return on the transaction. So you know, for the stream, for example, it's a $25 million stream, and they've got to give us 32,000 ounces of fixed ounces guaranteed gold back, and that's irrespective of whether or not the mine operates. So these guys own two other mines, and our deal is not only secured by the mine itself, but we also have parent company guarantees. So. Uh, they have to give us those ounces irrespective of how the mine performs. And then we've got a stream tail of 4% of production for the, the life of the asset. And so we're going to get a, a well in excess of 10% rate of return irrespective of how the mine goes. So uh, we're we're pretty pleased with the structure of that transaction, and I think they are too. And there's a lot of exploration upside there, right? Only 20% of the land has been explored so far, and they already have if I remember correctly, a pretty large measured and indicated resource. So with more drilling, that can be upgraded into reserves. Yeah, and that's that's a key in any of our deals is making sure that there's a lot of exploration upside in, in a large land package, and so this is no exception to that. Yeah, one thing I noticed about Sandstorm Gold lately, and this has been going on for two years, I don't think the stock was getting credit for it. Maybe now it's starting to get credit for it because the stock price the dip seemed to be bought more on the stock price. But it seems that Sandstorm Gold's partners, royalty and streaming partners, are having an immense amount of exploration success the last couple of years. A lot of people aren't aware of this, that Equinox Gold just announced a big resource increase at Arizona, both um, with the open pit mine, and it looks like there's going to be a potentially big underground mine portion as well. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing that all, all throughout our portfolio. We've, we've had um, probably seven, 700,000 meters drilled over the last year on our various royalty properties, and so we just got the numbers in a few weeks ago, and uh, 2018 was the third year in a row where more gold ounces were found on existing properties that we had royalties on than were mined on those properties. And so we, uh, we had an increase in number of gold ounces on the books, even after the production was produced, and we're shrinking our share flow at the same time through a share buyback. So, you know, if you're a shareholder of Sandstorm, you get the cash flow, you get lower numbers of shares outstanding, and you get higher number of ounces of gold on the books even before you account for acquisition. So, it's a pretty good, pretty good thing we got going on right now. And Sandstorm Gold has been using free cash flow for the buybacks, right? They haven't been using any of the revolving credit facility, right? The revolver was used. For Hyundai, the royalty last year, and then that was paid off for the year before. And then it, the revolver was used for the Fruta del Norte royalty, right? And that's being paid off now. And the revolver is being used for the America Silver deal? Yeah, the revolver was used partially for uh, Fruta del Norte, and then we've drawn on it a little bit more for the portion of the America Silver deal that we've advanced so far. And we've never once drawn on it for share buybacks. Share buybacks we're doing only with cash flow from operations right now. Okay, very good. Because there's a rumor going around the internet that you use debt for share buybacks, which I, I, I mean, I've been speaking to you for many years, and I know how you, your family history with debt, and I've heard you speak on conference calls about that. And I think you know that, like, the financial engineering using debt for share buybacks is not the smartest move. Yeah, those rumors are probably from people who don't know how to read financial statements. <laughs> okay, very good. I just wanted that out there in public because, you know, there, the rumor is going around. There's also rumors going around that there's problems in Turkey, but I've heard uh, one of my friends who's another analyst sent me um, the translations in English from a Turkish website saying how the permitting process for hot modern is actually going along pretty nicely as well. Yeah, I have uh, I've not heard of any problems and nothing's come to my attention that that uh, would give us cause for concern on the permitting side, so things continue to move forward there. And in terms of updates for Hot Modern, the next 
big major milestone for Hot Modern is next year with the feasibility study, right? Yeah, the feasibility. In fact, our uh, our geos are jumping on a plane today to go to a, a feasibility kickoff meeting with uh, with some of the guys in Australia, and and things are moving forward well there. Very good. So Arizona Arizona is going to be the newest asset at now after Cerro Moro is officially online on April first, and you guys got your first check from that. So congratulations. So um, are we going to get some uh, Samsung Gold shareholders going to get some cash flow from Arizona in the next month or two, or do you think maybe it's going to take a little bit longer? So if memory serves me correct, that royalty pays uh, quarterly, and so what you do is you sort of add up the gold production in a certain quarter, then it gets paid the quarter after. So Q2 will be the first quarter where there's production. So I expect to get a check in Q3 for that, and then things should start ramping up pretty quick in Q3. So I think Q4 this year will be the first time we get a sizable check for that. I actually ran into their CEO yesterday while I was going out for lunch, and, and uh, he seemed to be in a good mood. So hopefully things are, are ramping up well there. <laughs> well, well, they, ha they have on their website, on the Equinox Gold website, I don't know if you saw recently, but they just put this up in the last few days that they expect the first gold pour at Arizona in the next week or two. So it looks like, uh, obviously, you just said the Sandstorm checks are going to come after that, but it looks like things are very, very close to finally economic production or at least first gold pour. Yeah, exactly. And the other big news that most people are missing is the resource increase. I think it was 50% resource increase at Arizona. So that $5 million, it's on a sliding scale royalty, but that $5 million right now per year, that, thing could, that royalty could run a lot longer than a lot of people are expecting. Well, absolutely. I think, I think kind of the holy grail there, too, on the Arizona side of things is that with this underground resource that they're going to start drilling out even more is that it's higher grade as well. And so what you can do is all of a sudden with the same, when you start mining that with the same milling capacity, your gold production goes up dramatically. And I, I do believe that the gold price is going to get over uh, 1500 bucks here in, in the not too distant future. So, you know, eventually they're going to be mining much higher grades, producing more gold and our royalty won't be 3%. It'll be 4%. Because uh, when it goes over fifteen hundred dollars, the royalty rate goes up, and so you know you could see that five million dollars a year turn into ten million dollars a year pretty quick. So if if that gold price doesn't get to fifteen hundred dollars, are you gonna are we gonna see, in your opinion, the total gold production globally? Are we gonna see that start to decrease then? Because it seems that a lot of these companies, whether it's primary silver miners, primary gold miners, some of them because of their balance sheets are getting to the point where they can't pay all their capex for either upgrades or replacing reserves with exploration. So it seems we're very close to that point. Oh, yeah. If gold prices don't go up I would five years from now, the world would be producing less gold than it is today. Absolutely. Yeah, so the industry is labeling this peak gold, but I don't fully agree with that because that implies that there's a shortage of gold, but I think it's more of a function of price. That Because if you know the gold price is at 1500 or 1800 or 2000 or higher, there's a lot more marginal projects that can be brought online. Oh, of course. I mean, if gold goes to $2,000 an ounce, we're not at peak gold today. <laughs> peak gold will be five to ten years from now if, if it goes to 2000 an ounce. But if it doesn't change, I think we are at peak gold now. Okay, so it's, a, it's relative to price then. So just saying peak gold, you know, we're running out of gold, it's, it's, there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as we wrap up the interview, I just want to get your opinion on what types of new deals are available. So you touched on this briefly in the Sandstorm Gold conference call this week. It seems that there's a lot of, you mentioned there's a lot of mid-tier miners that are producing, that are looking for capital because they can't raise equity. Would you say that there's a lot of new mines coming online or a lot of the potential new mines are not economic at the current gold and silver prices? There are not a lot of new mines coming on. There are some mines that companies are currently trying to plan how they finance the construction of those mines. Uh, stream financing is involved in many of those conversations, so we're, we have a good sense of the pulse of what's financeable and what's not, and talking to the companies and talking to the banks. So part of our deal pipeline is, is exactly that, guys trying to figure out how they're going to go build their mines. There are still some people who are trying to... Um, fix their balance sheets a little bit and we're a part of some of those conversations and, and we're also talking to a bunch of guys about 
uh, buying royalties on exploration projects that they have. Those are obviously a lot smaller dollars for us and, and won't be a large portion of the capital that we outlay, but, but it is important to make those, those long-dated bets, and, and sometimes they pay off very handsomely. So we're, we're working on everything from $200,000 deals all the way up to $200 million deals right now, and, and it's pretty tough to handicap which ones are going to come through, but, but one thing I'm very confident is is that we will get a bunch more deals done. And you mentioned on the conference call that basically your phone is ringing off the hook on a daily basis from producing miners, and there's so many people looking for capital that your deal team, there's just too many, too many people calling and making offers, right? So basically, Sandstorm Gold is going to have a better choice. It's a buyer's market for deals, not a seller's market for deals at this point. So Sandstorm doesn't have to rush into anything considering, well, you guys have used a, a decent amount of your revolver but it seems that this is definitely a buyer's market right now for royalty and streaming companies, especially a company as large as you guys, because a smaller company might not have the capacity to do a larger deal. You mentioned up to $100 million, right, of potential deals on the conference call. Yeah, well, there's, there's a few deals we're working at that each are $100 million or more, but each potential deal is probably a low probability of getting done. So we'll keep working on them and see if there are deals to be done and... and uh, when we have something to announce, we'll, we'll let everybody know. Um, also, what's your opinion on the base metal miners? So copper, nickel, lead, zinc, those types of guys? Because, you know, we've had a rally the last couple of months in base metals, but over the last year or two, they've crashed. So do you think those guys, their balance sheet production costs, those guys are also in bad shape and are going to be looking potentially, you mentioned you like silver, and those base metal guys have a lot of silver byproducts do you think that there's going to be potential for those deals down the road? The, uh, the lead and zinc guys are hurting. Um, the, you know, there aren't a lot of lead zinc companies out there, but the ones that are out there are in much more rough shape now than they were before. We're, we're not particularly interested in lead or zinc, though, so we're not, unless they've got a low-cost uh, production and they're willing to sell silver byproduct, we're not really looking at any of those opportunities. Where we're more looking is copper. I do think that the copper price in the long run will be higher than where it is today, and it's an important part of the EV revolution. And I don't know whether copper's going up or down over the next one or two years, but I think 10 years from now it'll be a lot higher than where it is today. And a lot of the copper guys also have gold byproduct, and sometimes a bit of silver product as well, but, but predominantly a lot of gold byproduct production. And so we're looking forward to talking to some of those copper companies to uh, try to get some of that gold byproduct, and, and maybe we'll take a little bit of copper too, but we're mostly focused on the gold. So where, where do you see the company going over the next few years? You guys are at 22. You said 22 assets online generating cash flow. You have a couple more assets potentially with the Arizona royalty in a, in a month, give or take, and then the Fruta del Norte royalty later this year. America Silver, the Royal Team stream coming online next year. So where do you see the company a couple years from now if things are working out well with um, the size of the company, the balance sheet, the share buybacks, et cetera? Yeah, a couple of years from now, I think we'll be done done our share buyback. We will have done a few more deals, drawn on a revolver to do that. Hod Modern should be de-risked and permitted and, and starting construction. And so I think the portfolio a couple of years from now should have matured dramatically. Cash flow will be materially higher than it is today and going materially higher than that over the, the following couple of years. And I think we'll be in a good position to just keep keep step changing the company and, and keep growing it. Um, we're always willing to think creatively about how to grow this company. I, I am a believer that if you truly want a high valuation in the new finance world, you have to be able to appeal to U.S. generalist investors, and they don't really care about you until you're about a $5 billion U.S. market cap. So we have a long way to go before that, but we're just going to continue to try to grow this methodically and intelligently, and, and one day we'll get there. Do you think that the, it's fair to say that the company, Sandstorm Gold, overall now has totally left the startup phase, the frustrating and painful startup phase, and now it's in like the exciting and fun growth phase of the company where we're going to see a lot of good positive headlines. We're going to see nice revenue growth probably every year or two. We're going to see you know earnings growth, free cash flow growth. Um, shareholders are going to benefit from uh, share buybacks with free cash flow and other beneficial things. The startup phase is definitively over, and 
as you said, we're about a billion dollar market cap and we've got 190 royalties. And so the startup phase is over. I'm enjoying my job much more, although I'm working more because it's, it's becoming a bigger and bigger company and there's still no shortage in growth opportunities. But the startup phase is over and, and we're looking forward to uh, one day being a, a large mature company. And uh, lastly, you know, congratulations on Sierra Moro. You know, I remember reading articles when that deal was announced, um, when blood was in the streets in 2015. I, there was at least, I think, five articles on Seeking Alpha writing about Sandstorm Gold was going to go bankrupt when those deals were announced. And I put my money where my mouth is. I bought when there was blood in the, in the streets when the share was two, shares were around $2, $3 per share. I tripled my share position back then. And I was like, you know what, Nolan, I trust Nolan. I trust his track record. The deals look good on paper to me. He has immediate cash flow with them. And, you know, I believe that you had uh, your technical team, the changes you had done after Colossus Minerals would pay off and that, you know, Sierra Moral would finally come online and it would be a good asset. So congratulations. You proved the naysayers wrong. You proved the bears and the shorts wrong. Well, I enjoy doing that. <laughs> well, well, you just got the first check, right? So, like, I don't know what more they can say. They can say bad about the Sierra Mora asset. I remember hearing that, like, you can't invest in Argentina. Um, the mine is bad. You know, the, the, the deal is bad. You know, I remember just hearing all these things. It was just ridiculous. But, you know, now you have cash coming in from it, and it's the largest in Sandstorm Gold history, right? Yeah, it's one of the things that I've learned over the years is that although it's good to – listen to your shareholders to understand what they're thinking and what their complaints are and, and to truly understand how they're thinking. But just like anybody else, they're emotional beings and they're subject to the same mistakes of the masses, which is when every when their portfolio is down and they're losing money across the board and all their other stocks, they are very, very fearful and they're very pessimistic and they don't like acquisitions and they just assume everything's going to turn out bad and they're in a bad mood and it's when they're making tons of money on all their stocks and everything's going really well that everything's wonderful and all the CEOs are smart and and all the deals are going to be wonderful and everything's going to turn out great and you need to just ignore that and you need to ignore them and you need to ignore their emotions because the, it, your shareholders will be the first people to tell you don't do a deal at the bottom. I, I mean... They won't actually articulate it that way. They'll say, yeah, you should do deals at the bottom. But when you're actually at the bottom, they're freaking out, and you do a deal, and they're going, what the hell are you thinking? Why did you do that deal? And <clears throat> you need to be able to step back, control your emotions better than other people, and make intelligent decisions at the bottom, and do the exact same thing and control your emotions and make intelligent decisions at the top because it'll be your investors that tell you to buy, 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 buy at the top. I've experienced it personally through a couple of cycles now. And uh, so I hope shareholders of Sandstorm know that I, I love and respect their feedback, but I will do my best to ignore them <laughs> at the top. <laughs> Well, yeah, you can't, you can't listen to everyone. But, yeah, it's important to read opinions. But ultimately, I mean, it's your call. And you've mentioned this, I think, in the past, that you said almost half the net asset value of the company was based on investments you made at the very bottom of the cycle in late 2015, early 2016. Look at the value that was produced with the Yamana Gold deal, with the tech resources royalty package. I mean, there's a lot of assets in the Sandstorm Gold portfolio that are now only four years later, three, four years later, worth a lot more than what was paid. So you have good cash flow now from Sarah Morrow. Nolan, if that asset was for sale right now, that Silverstream for, for Sarah Morrow, how much do you think it would sell for? It would sell for, what, you paid, what, $75 million for it at the time in late 2015? Yeah, we paid $75 million for it. It's a silver stream. Silver prices have gone down, and we could still sell it for dramatically higher than what we paid for it because the mine is built, it's producing, and uh, they've had quite a bit of exploration upside success since then. So the thesis for us is playing out, and I can't wait to see silver prices not be 1470 an ounce and see something over 20 and, and then I'll be really happy. Well, if they, if they stay this low, there's going to be more deal opportunities. So, well, I'm kind of greedy. It's, you know, when there's blood in the streets, Warren Buffett says to be greedy when others are fearful, right? Although you've exactly. outlined the risk that people have to be with the balance sheet with the miners because mining is such a difficult business. Definitely. 
Okay, well, I've, I've kept you for quite a long while today, Nolan. I always enjoy my discussions with you, my shareholder, um, excuse me, my, my uh, podcast listeners keep emailing me, when are you going to have Nolan Watson back? I want to hear his insights into the gold market. So I want to thank you again for your time. And if our listeners want to learn more about Sandstorm Gold, maybe read that um, asset handbook, which I think ta- outlines a lot of the exploration successes and assets the company has that are not being valued right now, how do they do so? Yeah, they can just go to our website. Just go to Google and type in Sandstorm Gold. and will be the first thing that pops up. And go to our website or type in sandstormgold.com, and, and there's a ton of information, and our team's done a really good job of trying to put uh, creative videos and presentations and, as you said, asset handbooks. There's a lot to digest there, and, and I think you'll learn a lot if you go there. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you again for your time today, and I hope to speak to you again in three to four months. And uh, hopefully the gold price is higher, but if not, there should be more opportunities for Sandstorm Gold. Well, sounds good. Thank you very much, Jason. Please like this video, share it with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe to the Wall Street for Main Street YouTube channel if you have not already done so. Thanks for helping Wall Street for Main Street pass the 20,000 YouTube channel subscriber milestone despite YouTube censorship. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to 30,000 or even 40,000 YouTube channel subscribers quickly if YouTube doesn't shut down this channel. If YouTube does shut down this channel, remember to also sign up for the Wall Street for Main Street email list that's on the wallstreetformainstreet.com website and will tell you where the videos are going to be uploaded instead of YouTube. Also, if you really like the content and you decide that you want to give a one-time donation, you can go to wallstreetformainstreet.com, that's W-A-L-L-S-T-F-O-R-M-A-I-N-S-T.com website, where there's different options for you to do so. Or you can become a Patreon contributor. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to providing my loyal listeners with some of the best information, analysis, and financial education available out there, free or paid, as I work to grow the podcast and also get my educational technology company funded.